Hello, everybody. Um, I'm glad to welcome you to the fifth uh, Big Data Europe Project Hangout on European Open Science Agenda, Quo Vadis. Um, the, the Hangout is organized within the Societal Challenge 6, which is Europe in a Changing World, Innovative, Inclusive and Reflective Societies, one of the seven challenges that are covered in Big Data Europe Project. Um, this time our key, our key speaker is Ron Decker, who is recently appointed new CESDA director. In the past several years, he served as the project leader for open science as part of preparation for the Dutch EU presidency in the first half of 2016. And that was followed by moving to Brussels to work as a seconded, seconded national expert on open science at the European Commission, Deep Research and Innovation. Um, I will walk you very uh, briefly through the agenda for today. So, um, as usually, there is introduction about Big Data Europe project and CESDA as a host. Then Ron's presentation for more or less 30 minutes, followed by questions and answers session for another 15 to 20 minutes. In the end, we will wrap up and um, share our conclusions and impressions and, and say goodbye to you. Uh, but before we start, some important information. Uh, this Hangout is being recorded and all materials, including Hangout summary, slides and the recording will be made available on Big Data Europe website. Uh, also, I would like to uh, en encourage all, all the participants to use the chat for posting questions for the Q&A session uh, that will follow in the end. Uh, team behind this Hangout and other Hangouts to organize within Societal Challenge 6 in Big Data Europe projects are besides me uh, Martin Kaltenburg, who is from Semantic Web Company. Uh, Semantic Web Company is a technical partner of CESDA uh, in uh, Big Data Europe project in this specific societal challenge. Um, they are supporting us in every activity, including webinars, uh, as well as his colleague, Thomas Turner, who uh, takes care of all technical aspects behind each hangout. And there is uh, my colleague, Jean-Baptiste Milon, who is a senior project manager at CESDA, and he is not able to participate today, but Anyways, the organization of this and other Hangouts uh, relies highly on, on him as, as on other members of our team. So, having said that, I propose that we start with the introduction of the Big Data Europe project. So, as I said, this is the fifth Hangout. Uh, we had four before, um, I have to say, all quite successful, so we're hoping that this one will also be a good one with, uh, with a lot of interest. For Big Data Europe, its full title is Empowering Communities with Data Technologies. It's a three-year Horizon 2020 coordination and support action project with a single aim to uh, produce integrated stack of tools to manipulate, publish, and use large-scale data resources. So as I said, it's CSA uh, project. It means that it has two basic measures that has to has to apply to. So uh, there are coordination and support, and coordination uh, in this project means engaging with a diverse range of stakeholder groups, which represent particular Horizon 2020 societal challenges. There are seven of them, and uh, a group of partners in Big Data Europe project is in charge of each of the societal challenge, and as I previously mentioned, for societal challenge six, Europe in a Changing World. Um, hosts or, or responsible partners are CESDA and Semantic Web Company from, from Vienna. So that would be the coordination part. The support part means that the uh, project aims to designing, realizing and evaluating a big data aggregator platform infrastructure. So there is a huge technical part uh, in this project and basically uh, you have a number of partners which uh, are taking care of the networking and coordination part but then we have a number of technical partners who, who are taking care of a big aggregator platform that is being developed. Rationale behind this project is to show, of course, associated value of big data, uh, but at the same time to, to lower barriers for using big data technologies uh, that exist um, in uh, various forms and require effort and resources and, of course, are um, very much uh, connected to, to limited data science skills. So uh, the project is trying to help establishing cross-lingual, cross-organizational, and cross-domain data value chains. So there are three big data, these. So first is data velocity, how, how, how fast data is 
uh, data speed, so then uh, data volume, how big is that data, uh, is it megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and so on, and then data variety, um, uh, different types of data exist within each domain, and uh, data variety, also, although it's often neglected, is actually very important for social sciences and humanities, which are mostly, mostly addressed uh, within this societal challenge. So this one is actually quite important for us. As I mentioned, this is a big consortium with a number of partners uh, for the networking part and then for the technical part. SESDA is here, Semantic Web Company is here. We are the hosts of this particular challenge, challenge number six, and of this particular webinar. You can see that uh, partnership is well spread across Europe. And for the big data aggregator platform, uh, for each societal challenge, you have um, usually technical and networking partner who are taking care of that, that challenge. And within each societal challenge, we had a number of pilots, actually, we are preparing for the third cycle for the pilots, which usually mean putting actual data on the platform and, and observing how it, how it behaves and how can it be uh, of most, most service and use for the public. A few words about SESDA. SESDA is Consortium of Social Science Data Archives. It is a permanent research infrastructure uh, which, in a nutshell, cares about uh, allowing better access to data uh, regardless of data location or researcher's location. So basically, whenever, wherever in the world, you should be able to, to access data set you want through SESDA and, and uh, gain access to, to any of data providers that are uh, functioning within the SESDA. So the consortium. At the moment, we have pretty good European coverage. We have 15 member countries and one observer country, which is Slovakia. And maybe the most important important information about SESDA is that we are becoming an ERIC, which means European Research Infrastructure Consortium, this June. SESDA in Big Data Europe, uh, just to repeat it once again, unless somebody didn't hear it well. Uh, we are the main domain representatives for, for Societal Challenge 6. Uh, we, uh, our duty is to coordinate the social, Societal Challenge and its potential user community, uh, which mainly consists uh, of the fields of social sciences and humanities, whether it's uh, uh, data providers, whether it's, uh, it's scientists or, or decision makers. So it is a huge community. And out of this community, we are supposed to build interest group, collect requirements, and basically, with all of this information, assist the building of the big data infrastructure access point for social sciences and humanities. I would like to, to stop now to thank you for your attention, to also point you to the links that are on this uh, particular slide. So we are organizing our final workshop uh, on 11th of September in Amsterdam. Uh, it will be about the challenges of big data for societies in a changing world. Uh, info and free regist registration is here on this link. Then you can visit our website and uh, Twitter, slide share, LinkedIn groups and so on. Everything is here and you're very, very welcome. And for the final thank you, these are our contact information. So for me, for my colleagues, uh, of course, with any questions, just feel free to, to contact us. I would like to give floor now to Ron Decker says the director, to, to take us to the European Open Science Agenda. Where, where, where are we heading? Thank you, Ron. Okay, Ivana, thank you very much. Uh, yes, cool for this. Uh, what are the directions of social science infrastructure? I want to take you along on uh, four topics. Uh, br briefly discuss open science, go into the agenda of the European Commission, uh, focus on the reuse of data, and finally have some uh, di discussion and presentation on SESDA. So uh, open science, Oops. Uh, there is a trend uh, that science will open up, and that is for the benefit of science, it's good for the economy, and it's good for society. And within science, we can reach better contact between disciplines. We can work together along, dis uh, along disciplines, uh, facing at the grand challenges or the Millennium Goals. 
we can have a better connection of science with society. Um, I think citizen science is coming up very quickly and we can discuss and uh, improve on the reproducibility crisis which especially in social sciences uh, tends to be severe as uh, uh, half of the studies cannot rep reproduce the results. And so op open science is uh, a systemic change. Uh, it's the way in we do research. One moment, please. Now you see. Now you have a screen, I think. Thank you. Um, so just go back to the last slide. Uh, it's good for science, good for the economy uh, and, and good for society. And it's not a question whether there will be uh, open science, but uh, it's more the question uh, uh, how and when. And it's, it's about the change of doing research. Um, sometimes it's difficult to find um, uh, a definition, but I like the one by Michael Nielsen saying open science is the idea that scientific knowledge of all kinds should be openly shared as early as is practical in the discovery process. And it includes all kinds of, of uh, research outputs. So not only journal articles, but also data and software ideas. So we, we see a kind of unbundling of the traditional article. And yes, there can be practical uh, reasons to postpone publication or to, to, to share data because of legal or ethical questions. And open science is often represented by this double circle. The traditional way of doing science is in the inner circle. You have concept, you have data, do the analysis, publish and have a review. In open science, there is much more interaction with the outside world. So example, uh, we have uh, citizen science, we have uh, uh, preprints, uh, mean that we publish before the review takes place, and there are all kinds of uh, services and standards uh, coming up. So we see open science um, uh, being real because on, on the outside you see all kinds of tools that are used already within open science. So let's move to the EC agenda, the agenda of the European Commission where I think open science has been around for over 10 years but there was a big uh, stakeholder consultation in 2014 and 15 with workshops and the final report and then it was still called science 2.0 but the majority of the respondents prefer to to name it uh, open science and after this report there was strong uh, support by member states and what is called competitiveness council that is the meeting of the research ministers from the european uh, uh, union and they meet uh, twice a year or three yeah three to four times a year uh, and discuss things on innovation and research and the Commission came up with an European open science agenda and I will briefly discuss all these items during the presidency of Latvia there were already council conclusions by the member states by the research ministers pointing at the need for openness, to share data, to develop data skills, which I think is a very important uh, aspect of open science, and to set up e-infrastructures and networks. And one year later, um, during the Dutch presidency, um, the World Council conclusions specifically on open science, stressing the importance of open science, announcing the start of an open science policy platform and the European open science agenda. 
And on the content, it's uh, about uh, removing barriers, uh, promoting open science, and to have um, open access to publications and data. That was really the focus, because otherwise uh, the, the Dutch were afraid that it would get um, too broad. So there was a focus on data and publications. And there were agreements on how to follow up uh, these uh, council conclusions. Next to these council conclusions, there were some other products. And now I'm getting into Brussels jargon. ERAC stands for European Research Area Committee. And these have a task force. And this task force uh, made a report on optimal reuse of research data. And they had a number of recommendations on training, on data quality, funding, and sustainability, and, and also legal issues. I think one of the big issues in data and reusing data is who owns the data. It may depend by country, uh, but it's, it's a very complicated uh, matter and also has to deal, it interferes with privacy issues or sensitivity data issues. Next to this report, there was a presidency conference in Amsterdam. And this uh, Amsterdam conference had two important goals. To have full open access uh, for publications by 2020, and to set up a new approach towards optimal reuse of research data. I agree not to call this open data, because open data might, might be very confusing. Uh, data may be reusable, but open data may suggest that all data should be downloadable or on the internet. And I think especially in social science data, um, some data uh, needs uh, protection, or you have to subscribe, or make yourself known, or sign a contract. So. The, that's why the term reuse of uh, data uh, was um, um, put here. And also important is to have a flanking policy, because if you want to reach uh, and accomplish uh, open science, you need to change the current reward systems. Um, because uh, it's nowadays publish or perish, and you have to uh, publish, so data are considered as an asset for your new publication. And if uh, funders or governments want to, uh, uh, that researchers share their data, it should be in the, in the career system of researchers. And another aspect was that there are a lot of policies on uh, open science. And uh, in Europe, we need alignment on these policies. And instead of inventing new one, let's exchange best, best practices uh, and, uh, as I said, uh, align the policies. Just to briefly ex explain the practicalities of this Amsterdam call for action, it had uh, 12 recommendations. Uh, a lot of them uh, deal with data. For example, item number five is to introduce fair and secure data principles. Fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, and is an important aspect of uh, uh, optimal reuse of data. And not just to have these policy advice, each item, um, has uh, some pages discussing the problem, giving a direction for the solution. And on the right-hand page, you see specific actions for each of the stakeholders. So we try to be as practical as possible to, give, uh, uh, to reach out to these stakeholders to take care of open science. OK, uh, I hope you're still there. Um, and now let's go from policy into action. And um, at the European Commission, there is currently open access in the, in the current program, Horizon 2020. It says in the grant regulations that you should share your publications and data. 
and in the, the the commission has open air as a facility where you can deposit data or publications but there is no compliance on uh, on this grant regulation um, I will come back to this compliance later on it was also discussed uh, in the council conclusions to set up an European open science agenda so the commission set up this agenda focusing on eight topics the reward systems how to measure quality and impact uh, new models for publishing the data uh, fair data the cloud is an important one in, in in the within the european commission integrity including the reproducibility citizen science that is coming up and uh, of course the data skills and for each of these items, the, the Commission will install or has installed uh, expert groups. These expert groups consist of uh, uh, eight to ten independent experts giving an advice to the Commission. Next to that, the uh, Commission um, uh, also established a policy platform that consists of stakeholders. So. Here you can be a member if you uh, represent part of the, 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 the scientific cycle. And this policy platform currently consists of 25 people and they also advise the Commission. But uh, unlike the expert group who focus on one of these topics, this platform has an overarching view. So it tries to connect uh, on these uh, items and because they uh, are all stakeholders if they agree on an advice to the commission and already start implementing it in their uh, type of industry or in science or in, in data then that will be a very strong advice uh, to the commission so this policy platform meets uh, three, four times a year and discusses uh, these items of the European Open Science Agenda. And what the Commission also did is start a monitoring process. So um, it focuses for the time now on, on data, on publications and on, on uh, scholarly communication, which uh, uh, in, includes the use of, of uh, peer review of platforms so it's more policy oriented and each of these items is clickable and leads you to um, information on the topic this can be found on the EC website if you google on uh, European Commission and open science monitor you you, uh, you must find this one and also currently happening is the review of uh, the midterm review of Horizon 2020 and the new framework preparations are starting up and things that might be discussed uh, are the data management policy uh, the data management plans sorry the data management plans they might become obligatory within the uh, research uh, proposals to focus on monitoring and compliance and to develop tools um, uh, this is just my wording but EC open research could be a follow-up of what Wellcome Trust has been done to start uh, a, a type of journal or a type of platform um, where grantees of the Wellcome Trust can publish uh, their articles but also data and software and Welcome Trust um, puts the articles online after a sanity check uh, within two weeks and you get a peer review within a month so it's a way of very quickly publishing your output and another trend that is in, in, on publications is to acknowledge preprints as a valid uh, output but now let's switch to data what's going on on the reuse of, of data I think one of the buzzwords uh, is, is the cloud um, but I also think that uh, there is a trend coming up data as the new oil uh, data themselves uh, may become an infrastructure and 
it was in the Economist last no this this month um, that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil but data, and unlike oil, you can reuse data over and over again, but also unlike oil, I think we still have to think how we can uh, have value added to all these data, and in the picture are some companies who until now manage very good on making uh, data valuable. Um, other developments, especially in, in data, is this so-called uh, uh, FAIR data. Uh, data management plan is becoming more and more important and the cloud. I will uh, focus on, on, on this one. I have discussed already the trends in, in publication on preprints and open research and, you, and, and there are also new platforms coming up for, for, for publishing. But let's focus on the, on, on the data now. Uh, on FAIR, as I said, it's about findability of the data, accessible data, uh, interoperability to, to combine data and reusability. And there are some ideas are coming up to give a kind of Michelin score to each of these items. One of the examples is to have uh, um, uh, fair data uh, to score on the first three, and then the reusability is an average of, of these three items. And what is also already existing is a data seal of approval that focuses on the on the depositing of data, the process of uh, depositing data and the ingest of, of data. Um, for findability we need, I think, a, a catalog and for catalog you, you need good metadata that describe this data. Accessibility is very important in social sciences as we, yes, we need to store for the long term and you want to provide easy access, but it's also dealing with sensitive data or the privacy on, on data. So perhaps we need login or single uh, sign-ons to, uh, uh, to really access the data. Interoperability is uh, uh, to make data more comparable, uh, for example, in election studies that are in each country you may put effort in making the questions, uh, pointing where, which questions are comparable in the different data sets. And as I said, FAIR is really a, a, a buzzword currently in, in Brussels. On data management plans, um, that, that's a, a topic coming up. Uh, I have a number of slides and I will go uh, through them pretty fast. Um, on uh, a data management plan is asked uh, for um, uh, proposals or if you have been granted the proposal you have to come up with a plan and tell how about the data that uh, will be generated, how you take care of curation of the long-term uh, archiving and what will be open and uh, what not. Um, the trouble, I think, with data management plan is, is that it's being used by so many stakeholders for different purposes, um, for different types of data, and that makes it very complicated. So uh, you have uh, a gr great number of data management plans, um, and then again, I think we need some alignment or, or steering in, in this. And in developing data management plan, some key issues are whether you have one general plan or specified by discipline, who remains responsible for the data. This also goes back to the discussion, who owns the data? Is it a researcher or the university or the funder? Whether uh, this data management plan should be a living document that you keep track on uh, during the, the analysis? And whether it's obligatory, so you must comply, or is it comply or explain, so you, you may have an alternative data management plan. As I said, the stakeholders are many. Funders want to know what you're going to do with the data. Service providers like data archives want to know uh, about the quality of the data they, they are receiving. 
and researchers are uh, producers as well as uh, users of the data. Um, so, yeah, if, if I focus on, on requirement by, by stakeholders, you can see the, the process uh, starting from a project proposal, uh, doing the analysis, uh, reusing the data, for example, for reproducibility, but also at the end of the grant proposal to have a, the evaluation and to check whether the data have been deposited. What I see in data management is that we don't have uh, much tools, uh, we have more uh, rules. Um, so the sticks are that you must do with this. Uh, the, um, the danger is that it will just be a red tape. And I think we should look more for the carrots, uh, like uh, services that guide you through a data management plan. There is one initiative, DMP Online, uh, which has um, templates for different funders. So you go to DMP Online, you choose the funder you have to submit the, 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 the plan to, and it, it guides you through it. And what I see in other disciplines is that the lab journals are being used and they nowadays can be uploaded, for example, to, to, to Mendeley and then your lab journal automatically gets a DOI, so it's findable and you meet all the protocols of, of the funders or the research performing organizations like the universities or the, or the research institutes. So data management is, it, I think it's difficult, but there are some principles. Um, at least start as early as possible in the research process. In a number of countries, it's uh, obligatory to keep your data for a number of years um, and have it in a trusted repository because if you upload uh, the, the data in uh, Figshare or Dropbox, I question whether you will ever find back the data again. Um, Giving rewards to the data producer is a big topic, so uh, there should be uh, good facilities to cite the data. And of course, you have to comply with the law and codes of conduct. Again, these FAIR principles show up, and uh, in order to have um, data findable, we need uh, standards. Uh, we need standards on the metadata. In social sciences, that's the data documentation initiative. And within SESDA, we have a subset of this DDI uh, now uh, fixed uh, in a, in a 1.0 version. As an approach, um, uh, I should stress it's a possible approach because there is now a working group of Science Europe and there is an approach by the American ICPSR Institute on Social Science Data to distinguish uh, what you do before the project, during the project, at the end of the project, and in the phase of depositing data. Um, I think these could be uh, useful chapters within a data management plan. And then again, I want to stress the importance of collecting metadata. Otherwise, you won't find the data or you won't be able to search through the data. So much for the data management plan. I want to switch now to the clouds. Um, actually, the, the, the European Open Science Cloud is a part of a three actions within the Commission. It's the clouds itself, but it's also on the data infrastructure where you deal with high performance computing, uh, data and network infrastructures. And it's also about widening uh, beyond science, so the use by SMEs or industry or government. And if I focus on the European Open Science Cloud, which is um, uh, now uh, being discussed at, uh, at the policy departments within the, in the Commission, it's, uh, the goal is to make full use of data uh, and the data-driven research. And for that, uh, Europe thinks it's, it's good and cost-effective to have a cloud infrastructure 
where European researchers can store and manage and analyze their data and also reuse data. And we are not starting from scratch. It's, uh, there are a lot of existing infrastructures. And I think the challenge is to uh, combine in an efficient way existing infrastructures, build uh, new infrastructures, and also um, take care of how to combine these. Um, discussions now focus on the governance and there is a European pilot on, on uh, cloud governance just started that will go for two years. But I think it's important to look at the data and service layers as well as the infrastructure. And in my opinion, these two should merge into services to researchers. So we should stop with building silos of uh, computing and storage and networks and data. As a researcher, I want to log in, I want to find my data, I want to reuse data uh, in a single platform. And yes, we, we have a lot of policy discussions in, in Europe on this. Uh, however, these clouds are already existing, especially in the US. Uh, the National Institute of Health has a pilot on, on uh, Commons. Uh, it's kind of data platform. The National Science Foundation has an open science cloud and there are the commercial parties like Microsoft and Amazon who are uh, offering services and especially these uh, commercial parties, they have a lot of experience on how to set up this infrastructure and perhaps this is shown by the next picture, this one uh, showing uh, the data. Uh, amounts and it's it's Google who has 15,000 petabytes um, which is much more compared to any other uh, platform um, that is currently running and we talk about big money these these uh, the Googles and the Facebooks they have big data centers and one data center is just an investment of one billion dollar and that money has to come back uh, some way. So on this on this cloud infrastructure, I think the pr parameters are whether we build up clouds by nation, which might be less efficient, or by discipline, but that needs a lot of coordination over countries. Whether we, we remain with the pipelines, so the, the, the different silos for computing, for networking, for data, or integrate them as a service on platforms. And whether we start with some pilots, like the Americans do, or first have an extensive discussion on governance and, uh, and, and then start designing the, 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 the infrastructure. And I think it's, it's mainly a cultural challenge. Yes, we have the parameters, but we must solve the questions how to bring trust. I think trust is the major topic in reusing data. And of course, we can all kinds of safety procedures and contracts, etc. But if the parties, the, the, the data producers and the reusers don't trust each other, then nothing will happen. And yes, of course, we must have this environment. We must build uh, on uh, authentication. Um, we must be sure of the quality of the data, how to deal with sensitive data. And as, as I said, we must have a culture of sharing data. Just now, to, to uh, as a brief intermezzo, to give you some trends that are discussed by the publishing uh, organization STM, which are, of course, publishers, but you will see they also deal with data. In their 2015 forward look, they saw data as a first-class research object. So no longer the, so only the article, but also data. The next year, then the forecast was very complicated. I tried to summarize it, but it's about the machines. It's the machines as the new reader. Uh, if, if you take into account that we uh, science publishes about 3 million articles a year, and a single researcher can read 400, then you have a problem of getting visible. But also, if the machines could read the, uh, the, the articles and the data, 
that would lead to a whole new type of doing science. And that was the trend that was uh, thought of last year. This year they went to a pinball machine and here you see again even in publishing it's about trust and integrity uh, of, 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 the, of the research. And I think in building platforms it's a willingness to, ch to share but it's also creating win-win situations and one example is in this structural genomics consortium where they have a partnership between universities and the big pharma industries uh, where they uh, agreed to cooperate where they agreed to focus on a number of, uh, of, of proteins to do the research on without revealing individual preferences and it's up to any party to uh, uh, to start a commercial track uh, at, at one point in time and this turns out to be a very successful consortium because the, the industry benefits and the research also benefits so I think it's, it's to be part of a new era of open science if you want to reach more people if you want to have greater impact and be more efficient and you want to preserve data for future researchers then uh, I think you must join this open science idea and have impact not only in science but also in, in society and uh, and in innovation and again here we need a different career and reward system at universities I think Okay, um, coming to the last point of, of CESDA, um, our idea is that we see a trend in this platform revolution. So it's not only a be, a being archived, taking data in, but it's also being a platform bringing data out. Because the, the kernel of a platform is to have interactions between producers and consumers. And the, the, the value creating part can be money, but it can also be other items like prestige or, or recognition. And platforms create this value by reducing barriers. And we have some uh, good examples in the, in the commercial uh, sector where they already have these platforms. And if you, for example, look at the stock exchange uh, 10 years ago there was one company of, of the IT company in the top 10 and the other ones were, were the oil uh, industry and indeed if you look nowadays then uh, uh, six out of ten uh, will be platform companies like the Googles and the Amazons. Uh, um, back to CESDA uh, our mission is to have a, a research infrastructure that enables that enables the research community to perform high quality research and I have discussed the trends I see science will open up data becoming more important and the platform as a means to for interaction and, and our vision is to have a platform to provide seamless access so it should be easy for the researchers to fair data in a safe and secure way so this is, this, is, this is our vision and we are organized um, uh, by, by countries. Uh, the countries are a member of CESDA but most important is if you become a member you must have a service provider on, on data services. And yes there are other service providers but it's obligatory to have a data service provider. And other stakeholders are, of course, the researchers uh, themselves. Um, our strategy follows three lines on technology to build the backbone uh, for our catalog. Uh, we have new projects uh, on, on single sign-on, on, on secure access. Um, we have to build on trust. Um, and that can be done technically but I think we have to meet and join or our service providers have to meet with the researchers and uh, we as providers must be trusted and uh, also very important is the training 
if we have new data, complex data, big data, we should provide training. And uh, SESDA might be the role of train the trainers, for example, in, in, in research libraries, and to provide tools like uh, on the data management plans. And yes, we want to be part of the European Open Science Cloud, where we will uh, provide uh, tools for deposit and reuse. We provide training and work out principles how to use social science data. So um, that concludes. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Ron. This is Martin speaking. Hello, everybody. Martin Kartenberg from Semantic Web Company. Thanks a lot, Ron, for that insights and that great overview over open science in Europe, where we are and where we're going to, but also looking over the, the borders to the US and initiatives that are happening worldwide. So one uh, reminder for our audience, there is a chat in the panel. And into this chat, you can put your questions. You just open the chat and you just start typing. And we will pick your questions then and hand them over to Ron. So feel free to start typing now, please. In the meantime, maybe a question that I'm curious about, Ron. Uh, you said this, uh, it, it's very important that industry and research will work together, or academia. Um, maybe I missed that, but uh, I know that there is there are initiatives by the Commission about digital single market on the one hand side, and data markets are popping up all over Europe, and on the other hand side there is this open science pos uh, policies. Um, is there something that is interconnecting these worlds so that also industry and research on this policy level and European Commission, European level, will work together better? Um, yes, I, I, I think there is, uh, um, uh, they are looking for these, these combinations. I, I mentioned some examples of win-win situations, uh, for example, in, in genomics. I also see uh, these um, cooperation existing, for example, in, in, in Norway between the, the Institute for Marine Research and the fish industry, uh, where it's very important to keep your role as research institute and to keep your role as, as a fishing industry. Um, so there must be benefits for both to cooperate. And that could be one of the main major incentives. I know that there will be a, a kind of a cloud summit uh, in two weeks in, in Brussels on, on the cloud, uh, yeah, on, on the European Open Science Cloud, where these type of ideas and actions are being discussed. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, because I think that's the, the crucial point also to bring, on the one hand side, to bring together research for sure, uh, but also to have interoperability then with industry and economy, so that all these data fits together, uh, as you said. Um, I think you, you just answered uh, one of the questions that were coming in uh, that is saying, what is the status of the European Open Science Cloud? So mm -hmm. you said there will be a summit uh, but as far as you told me, I think there's also a pilot coming up. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, there is, um, there is a pilot on governance that is now running uh, by a great number of partners, partners uh, working on clouds. Uh, this is a two-year project. The Cloud Summit will be on, on June 12, uh, led by the, the Commissioner Moedas and, and, and the DG uh, Robert-Jan Smits, um, to, to, to see, uh, I, I think the topic is, do we go top-down or let we, uh, do we have pilots and let 1,000 or 100 flowers bloom and, and just get started? Because I think it's very important to, um, to experience in running clouds, um, and only by doing it, you you will see what what the, the real barriers uh, will be. I totally agree. Also, in the area of trust and security and all these things, I think putting the hands on when we speak about technology is absolutely the right thing. Thank you very much. Um, 
there's one thing coming in. Uh, I'm not sure if you answered already in your presentation, uh, but maybe partly it's about the data management plans. So you said it's very important to align all these things. Uh, is there is there a plan, a strategy in place, how to align that, maybe as an add-on? I know that in Austria, our national funding agency is also now, uh, we have mandatory data management plans. So also there, a new bunch of data management plans coming in by national and by international uh, funding agencies. Yes, and, and that's why I think uh, that, that that should be aligned. Uh, as I said, uh, Science Europe, which is a, a, a club of, of um, research funders and also research universities, they are now discussing an approach to, to align these data management plans. And there is one of the discussions is whether you must allow for disciplinary differences. I think you should or that it should be one size fits all. Um, but as, as you mentioned, uh, if every university, every faculty is setting up its own data management plan, then we will end up with uh, a lot of plans. And I would like to have a check on uh, who is using or checking on this data management plan. If, if no one is, then then stop it. If, uh, um, if, if it is being checked by, for example, the service providers because they want to get high quality data in, then, then we have a, a good way or a good reason to, to set up a data management plan because it's preparing for your deposit of the data and data management plans can help in providing the metadata because if you have to do this afterwards as a researcher, uh, then the money is gone, uh, your time is up, you don't like it anymore, you're, you're uh, already on your next project. So you have to uh, collect and, and uh, um, store and organize your metadata during the project. I think that that's an important uh, issue of a data management plan. I totally agree. I think as an add-on it would be good, but maybe that is already on the plan or in place to have something like a common schema so that ensures interoperability of the data sets and then you can see or you and that these metadata is then be be open so it can be harvested through different countries across Europe. And then you can easily also find out and say, oh, these are the, the data sets that will be opened or that are already opened by Austria, for example, or by the Netherlands. And that would help researchers a lot, I guess. And maybe there are restricted ones, but you know who is dealing with them. And it could be interesting to send a request to get more details. But I think it's the... Yes, because data can be restricted, but the metadata could be still be open. Fully agree. Yeah, I think that's the the thing of findability that you represented in the FAIR model, as far as I understood. So that would be really great. Um, I see that there are not more questions coming in at the moment, although we have still lots of participants in here. Uh, but I think you can also give a follow-up. So if you have questions to Ron Decker, uh, you can can ping us, you can send us a line, we will bring these questions up or bring you in touch with Ron. Uh, I will just repeat what, what Ivana said at the beginning. So uh, we are recording the webinar and uh, the slides and the webinar recording will be made available uh, through bigdataeurope.eu in around one week latest. Uh, I think we can also send a follow-up to registrants and, and attendees of this webinar that you get informed. So that's the one thing. When you're interested in that topic and you saw, ah, oh, the Big Data Europe uh, S6 group is coming to Amsterdam in September, um, I just looked it up, the topic of our workshop, and the workshop is free uh, to join in. Uh, on the 11th of September it will be um, research data and open science and the importance of big data and uh, metadata in that area. So a follow-up uh, and you can also meet then Ron Decker in person because he will be one of our speakers. Beside other people we have already uh, confirmations by Eurostat for example or by DANS that is the, the Dutch uh, archive, digital archive. So I think for me 
uh, it's time to say thank you very much for listening for today and mainly thank you very much for Ron, uh, to Ron for, for a great presentation and answering all the questions. And also to Ivana, thanks a lot for the introduction. So maybe a, a short last word by you two or saying goodbye. And from my side, goodbye and thanks for listening. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and um, yeah, perhaps we'll meet in uh, September in Amsterdam or uh, in discussing data management plans or clouds. Thank you. Thank you also from my side and hope to see you again in, in Amsterdam or in our next and last webinar. So thanks again. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye.